you know, I, I'm not done with the Mariah Shock issue, you know, because I think that there's a, a special uh, circumstance here. You know, I mean, Friday, Governor Hochul said, we need more alcohol and, and drug treatment. Well, guess what? That's what they were getting at Mariah Shock. Hi there, it's WAMC News Director Ian Pickus. And on this episode of the WAMC News Podcast, we cover the forthcoming closure of six New York State prison facilities across the state. Last week, the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, or DOCS, announced the closures as of March 10, 2022. Among them is the Mariah Shock facility in Essex County. Officials in the region are not pleased with the decision, not only because of the community impact, but because of the loss of unique programs provided at the facility. Before we speak with New York State Correctional Officers and Police Benevolent Association President Michael Powers, we start with this report by our North Country Bureau Chief, Pat Bradley. The Mariah Shock Incarceration Correctional Facility is a minimum security facility with a current staff of 107 and 74 incarcerated people with a capacity of 300, according to DOCS. Republican Town of Mariah Supervisor Tom Skazafava is astounded that Mariah Shock was chosen to be shuttered because he says the programs there are much different than in other correctional facilities. It's actually a program that offers alcohol and substance abuse treatment. And you have education classes. Most inmates leave there with a GED. They have work programs, and it's a six-month sentence. Many of those sentences were reduced from from a three- to five-year sentence. So I was really surprised to hear that they um, would close that facility. I do understand, you know, that the inmate population is decreasing, but that's the kind of programs that are needed, what Mariah Shock provides. So I was really dumbfounded as to why they would, would close that facility. Republican State Senator Dan Steck of the 45th District plans to challenge the decision. In the case of Mariah Schock, a unique program. A lot of your progressives, they wanted different programs. They wanted to treat substance and alcohol abuse. Mariah Schock, I mean, that was a special program created to do that. So I was very surprised and disappointed to learn that they're closing that. That's the program that you would think that they would be sending more people to and investing more and not getting away from. You know, I'm not done with the Mariah Shock issue, you know, because I think that there's a, a special uh, circumstance here. You know, I mean, Friday, Governor Hochul said we need more alcohol and, and drug treatment. Well, guess what? That's what they were getting at Mariah Shock. Supervisor Skazafava says it's not just local and regional officials criticizing the plan to close Mariah Shock. Former inmates are writing letters as to how that program turned their lives around. Recidivism rate is much lower in that program. So again, you know, what their reasoning is, I, I don't know, it befuddles me. North Country Chamber President Gary Douglas calls the entire prison closure process flawed and short-sighted. The other thing that makes no sense is that they're not really factoring in what the redevelopment prospects are for a site after they close it. I mean, the state should care about that. The inmate population will be transferred to other institutions, and the Department of Corrections will work with unions regarding staff transfers. The state expects to save $142 million by closing the six facilities. I'm Pat Bradley, WAMC News. Now, the other closures include Ogdensburg Correctional Facility, Willard Drug Treatment Campus, Southport Correctional Facility, Downstate Correctional Facility, and Rochester Correctional Facility. DOC says it will work with bargaining units to provide staff transfer possibilities and does not anticipate layoffs. The closures are expected to save $142 million in taxpayer funds. I got reaction from NYSCOPA President Michael Powers. Thank you for having me. What was the initial reaction uh, to the word of the closures and uh, the site locations that were announced? Frustration, obviously. Um, you know, and, and to answer the second part of your question, uh, the genuine concern was it's completely contradictory of the uh, position that the governor took um, related to um, her statements a couple weeks ago regarding um, the, the, the correctional setting closures, um, many of which of, of the ones listed that you mentioned are treatment centers. She's calling for repurposing of these certain facilities uh, for treatment centers. And, you know, she has a genuine concern over the 
the um, uh, the recent uptick in violence in many of our bigger uh, metropolitan areas, and um, uh, you know taking cell space uh, through the maximum security is, in our opinion, we 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 wonder you know was, was there a bit of a disconnect between the department and the governor, uh, and and recognizing that she's just coming into office, you know, and 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 no fault of her own, obviously, but you know this could have been uh, preordained prior to that prior to all this. And may very well have, but uh, makes me wonder whether or not the department's actually listening to the governor and her positions. Well, the Hochul administration and docs say that um, most of these places are well below capacity right now. So it's just a matter of filling the existing space uh, with the number of uh, prisoners or, or people who are incarcerated and using the space in a better way. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, yeah, the, the inmate population's down. Uh, you know, we, we recognize that. You know, but uh, in, in the broader scope of things, you know, in, in the plans that she's looking to put forward in her administration is kind of contradictory. I mean, three of these sites are rehabilitation sites, you know, treatment centers. And uh, that's that's what she's looking to do with some of these other shuttered facilities around the state of New York. And we've called upon for a, a new rehabilitation model. Um, we've been advocating for this since, quite frankly, the COVID pandemic started in March of 2020. We've been asking for a um, more spread out inmate population. So to, to give you a little back backstory on that, the inmate population has significantly decreased in the last seven years. But what's, what's the troubling trend is the amount of violence that continues to occur each and every year um, in the last seven years. So with an inmate, dec- uh, inmate population decreasing, we're seeing a consistent each and every year since 2014, and this year is on pace to exceed last year's numbers, more assaults on staff, more inmate on inmate assaults, and higher levels of contraband coming into our facilities. Significantly higher. Um, you know, and, and that is troubling in itself. We've asked for legislation. We, we have it in both houses. It's a title. It doesn't move anywhere. And we're asking for a study for the legislature to take a good hard look at the violence and the concerns that our members deal with consistently every day. So to fall back on the COVID aspect of 2020, we've been asking for that proper social distancing to create a better model, a more secure model of rehabilitation to allow, instead of housing uh, 50 inmates in a a densely uh, populated area, we're asking to decrease that down into the 30s to spread them out a little more, create a better, instead of being on top of each other, a little more comfort room, more humane aspect of incarceration, if you will, and for the rehabilitation model. And that, that you know, we, we've, we've spoke to every legislator, every high end, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, in both committees and corrections in both the, 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 the Senate and the, the Assembly, and we get nothing at the end of the day. Yet we're the ones being stabbed, slashed, cut, urine, feces, and everything else thrown upon us. And, and, you know, there's there's no discussions with the stakeholders. And that's our biggest concern going forward. Now, there there are dozens of facilities in New York state and most of them will be remaining open with the inmate population down by thousands um, in recent years. Can't your vision be accomplished using the existing spaces and, and closing some of them? That's what we're asking for. That's all we've asked for. You know, we, we recognize that the, you know, the, we, we know that the last year's budget called for closures and, and, and the sitting governors had to inherit that. Uh, we understand that, you know, but at the end of the day, what we're basically looking to do is just what you said, is, is to create, you know, to, to, to disperse those inmates so that they've got a better, safer environment for the rehabilitation process. You know, with many of the, with the, many of the parole reform laws out there, you know, there's, there's just, you know, there, there's the need for that. Let me ask you about the employees. Doc says that, you know, transfer possibilities are in play here and doesn't anticipate layoffs. Is that your understanding of the situation? Yes, it is. I mean, you know, unfortunately, this isn't the first time we've had to go down this road with facility closures. We dealt with them last year. We dealt with them the year before. And we understand that. And we work closely with the department in trying to find um, uh a decent um, a landing spot for some of our members, but recognize the fact that, that I mean, this upends a family, this upends a community, and this upends an, an upstate community or a downstate community that may rely heavily on those living wage jobs as, as an economic uh, 
aspect. But just recently, it's funny you mentioned that because just recently, earlier today, I spoke with an individual who's currently in, a, in one of these affected facilities. And this, he, he now commutes an hour and a half from his home where his wife and children live and his children are being schooled. This is the fourth facility closure that he's had to deal with going forward. We've got many members that were that were that had to deal with facility closures last year and they're going to have to deal with them again this year which potentially uproots your family uh, it, 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 it pulls a coach possibly from from any aspect of a community uh, a volunteer firefighter uh, EMT you know I mean you, you name it potential substitute teacher you know any, anything of that nature uh, you know uh, occupation uh, so it has a huge impact on on our membership and and that's that's where the frustration sits in and since covid and the amount of violence in our facilities the morale in our facilities is is the worst i've ever seen it and i've been in this position for 7 years and uh, you know we've endured a lot of changes but the uh the, the, the these guys are broken beaten down and uh they, you know they're working long long hours being taken away from families, you know we've got uh, we've got issues out there regarding COVID that are that, that we have to deal with consistently, and and it's 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 just it's just starting to get to get to be too much for some of our members. What would you say to the argument that has been made uh, a lot, especially in recent days, on news of of the prison closures that it's just not a good economic model to have uh, such a facility be the main economic driver, you know, in a rural area? Well, it depends on the rural area, right? I mean, you know, where, where are you talking? You know, um, you know, a, a lot of state jobs and, and a lot of communities are, are good, solid living wage jobs. And, and, and those jobs, you know, that, that gets recirculated through the, through the community and the tax base. You know, that all depends on where the area is. And, and you're hitting, you're hitting uh, areas of the state that, that are going to have, a, a, you know, a big impact on the local economies. That, that's just that's I'm not saying that it's a jobs program, but are correctional facilities necessary? Yes, they are. Are there bad people out there? Yes, there is. And, and with that being said, you know, these, the, many of these communities um, um, asked for these facilities when, when the boom uh, um, back in the early 80s and mid 80s and 90s and the drug ep- epidemic uh, that, that came up and they were locking people up for drug drug offenses and you know, these communities took them in and, and now, you know, because of that very reason. And now they're being shuttered with no plan in place, no plan in place. There's nothing in place. We've, I, 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 I can count probably 16 shut correctional facilities since 2009 or 10 that, that, that are just vacant lots that could be used for rehabilitation purposes uh, a, a better, uh, a better consistent model of rehabilitation that we've been harping about, and and you know, we, you know we're it all falls on deaf ears. No, no conversation with stakeholders again. Michael Powers is the president of the New York State Correctional Officers and Police Benevolent Association. Thank you so much for taking this time. Thank you, Ian. Have a good day. All right, that does it for this episode of the WAMC News Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. I'm Ian Pickus.